Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom? Michael, how the fuck are you doing? I'm actually very spectacular. Yeah, this is great. This is just all manner <laughs> of great right now. We're doing Final Destination on the goddamn show today. Yes, we are. You are, uh, of course, as a listener, listening to Double Feature. And uh, this is one of those episodes where we talk about a bunch of, a bunch of splat films. Yeah, we talk about a bunch of children dying. I was, you know, I keep wanting to say a bunch of slasher films. Uh-huh. It's, I I mean, whatever. What do people expect? Like, there are only so many films with more than four sequels. Just because the slasher is invisible. And <laughs> uh, we're talking about Final Destination today. And uh, we're going to go through every single one of the five Final Destination sure. films. Um, we're going to spoil them, mm-hmm. especially the last one. Yeah. That's, uh, yeah, a lot of people will listen to the Killapalooza shows and not care. But, man, if you've seen the first couple, just do the whole goddamn thing. Yeah, just, this is definitely one of the best uh Because we can't not through. talk about that ending, yeah, right? We no. have to. Yeah, we have to. We have to. Uh, so I've put some chapters in the show. This is a thing we're doing now. There are chapters inside the show that you've downloaded, so you can skip the Final Destination films you haven't seen. And you know what? Save this file on your computer. It's on the internet. You can come back to it. Uh, pretty much any time you want. So we had a little bit of a scare when we came in the studio yeah. to record. Ugh. Uh, your mic is making a extremely loud hissing sound. Yeah, something was going on, and we were terrified that it was the actual microphone. Oh God, because um, the microphone's expensive. Microphone's expensive. I think Turns it's just out, this cable. Just the cable. Here. I don't. Significantly less expensive. Still needs to be replaced. Studio is <laughs> a nightmare. I've tried, uh, I'm trying fundraising outside of Double Feature as well. I just pawned my keyboard amp for that, uh, that oh, beautiful yeah. Nord Lead 2. Also, if you look around the studio, you will notice the beautiful Nord Lead 2 is also missing. Yes. It's, uh, it's sad. The, I'm just going to keep chalking it up to minimalism and not to our show being poor. Uh-huh. What we're trying to do is streamline the show. I sold that keyboard amp, right? And I'm selling it on Craigslist, which if you don't live in the United States or a big city, you never use this. It's just, it's wanted ads yeah. on the internet. So, selling this thing on Craigslist, and you get all these people throughout the week who shoot you an email back and forth. Uh, somebody for some, some church or something wanted to buy it. And, uh, and I didn't really even remember which person was which. Uh, eventually, this girl said she's going to come pick it up. So, this happened yesterday. So, yesterday, she comes to pick up the keyboard amp. And it's always a little awkward when you sure. meet someone from Craigslist. But uh, I go downstairs to let her in here, and uh, she's with her friend. And they're, they're about our age. It's really awkward, though. Like, more awkward than usual, Yeah. right? And I'm trying to remember back, because as we're walking up the stairs, something's, something's just off. I feel like maybe I, I did something weird. Uh-huh. I mean, I look like a fuck-up, sure. right? So that could be it, too. Right. You're going to meet a stranger on the internet. Who's this stranger going to be? And then he looks like me. Uh-huh. I, you don't, but but usually, Michael, my warm and charming personality, it basically just shows people that I'm not a serial murderer or rapist. Right. You know, sure. within the first uh, couple minutes in the interaction. Mm-hmm. Point of the story is this: as we're walking upstairs, I go, "Oh, are these the people from the from the church?" And you know, because I'm a dick, because I'm going, sure. "Oh, they're religious. That's why they're weird," which isn't true, right? At, at all, it's not like all yeah. religious people are weird because. Most people are fucking religious, right? Yeah, so that would mean most people are weird. Yep. Clearly not true. That's, yeah. Dead however, <laughs> however, as we're walking upstairs, I look down and I realize I am wearing my machete t-shirts. Ah. Now you've seen this shirt. I have. You know what this is. Yeah. For people who are not familiar with machete, it's Lindsay Lohan dressed as a nun Looking a very phallic looking revolver. Mm-hmm. And I pretty much felt like the worst human being <laughs> alive. Final destination. Yeah. The point of that story is that we're taking donations. Uh, so donate.doublefeatureshow.com. My thought process on the donations is basically this you go on iTunes, you buy a song. What does that cost? Dollar? Yeah, I think so. One, 129 like that. or uh, something to that effect. 
Uh, you go on there, you get our show, our show totally free. Song lasts a couple minutes. We, uh, we're on episode, what, 204? Yeah. That's uh, hundreds of hours of entertainment. So I just want to vote with your dollar thing. Maybe it's only worth 129 That's fine. Donate.doublefeatureshow.com. <laughs> Maybe a couple bucks more. You decide. The first Final Destination film is uh, directed by James Wong. Uh-huh. Now, you've seen a couple James Wong films. Yeah. The other Final Destination films. Right. Final Destination 3. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> So he was a writer on The X-Files and on uh, that spinoff, Millennium. I think he did the pilot for Lone Gunman, uh-huh. the other sure, X-Files the other spin-off. spinoff. And then something that's, I, I think it's still going on now, um, American Horror Story. Yeah. Do you watch that? I do watch that. That's a pretty in- enjoyable show. Yeah. So James Wong kind of knows his stuff. Sure. But I think uh, the- He's clearly a creepy guy, just based on what you've listed. Yeah, definitely. You know, we have this movie now that's, uh, you know, looking back- it's a movie from 2000. Uh-huh. It still feels like it's from 1996. Anything with Devin Sawa, for me, feels like it's from 1996. It's weird, isn't it? This is an era that we've only ever passed through. Sure. You know, we've yeah. never quite... Uh, I mean, it's come up in the different slasher franchises, mm-hmm. as you might expect. Yeah. But never where we could sit and study it. Yeah. For a, what was coming out around this time? Well, in Slasherdom, this is, what, the year before Jason X... Sure. Freddy's long gone. Yeah. Uh, Chucky is in bride stage. Yeah, that's that's right um, about there. Halloween is uh, H2O. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, Halloween H2O is great. Yeah, and I think this is right around uh, Alien Resurrection as well. So Yeah, that's probably in there somewhere. All of these, uh, these are all the movies that basically reinvented those franchises. Sure. Halloween H2O and Bride of Chucky, these yep. are when they became serious films, right? Of course. And Final Destination starts there. And it's the first time we've ever seen a French because we did Saw, yeah, uh, which started just a few years after this. But yeah. it's so far disconnected Vastly from different. the 2000. Well, I think part of that is that this movie, you know, all the time we're talking about, didn't know it was a franchise yet. This film identifies with the other horror movies of the time, not the other slasher franchises, right? So it's not looking to Jason and saying we have sequel potential. It's looking to. Uh, I don't know, to Scream and... Urban uh, Legend. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Urban Legend. I know Jeepers, what you did last creepers. summer. Sure, sure. A lot of these movies that were kind of just these kind of teenage, I want to call them 90s horror, but I guess it was early you know, late 2K. 90s. Yeah, yeah, you got it. So something about that. I mean, it's just perfect. The look, the uh, the actors, um, Sean William Scott. That's how yeah. you know. Right? That's how you know exactly what this movie's <laughs> going for. Because on the, the flip side of things, American Pie was coming out. Right. That was... Uh, you Dude, know. where's my car? <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> Although American Pie, in and of itself, it it's on, what, nine movies yeah. now? 14 we'll, movies? We'll have to do uh, Killapalooza with American Pie, but the only I two people American that die Pie would be you and me. Rivaling, uh, now that's what I call music. Volume, oh my God, uh, or The Land American Before Time. Time. Yes, yes, clearly. So uh, the thing that kind of made me realize really the particular dead on the year we were in is and I realized this during the scene where they talk about all right the plane's gonna blow up. Mm-hmm. That kid jumps up and he starts shouting that on an airplane, and uh, I'm thinking to myself, this is also a pre 9 11 flight disaster movie, right? Like, well, and that's right obvious. Before 9 11, that's obvious because the second anybody stands up post 9 11 and says the plane's gonna blow up. They're immediately tackled and taken sure. off the plane. Sure. In this, people are trying to get them to calm down. They're trying to right. get them to listen to reason. Do we really have to throw you off this plane, sir? Right. Or will you please go back to your seat? Yeah. Yeah. You're not allowed to stand on an airplane anymore, which is weird. Yeah. It's one of those things that now, you know, 10 years later or whatever, um, after 9-11, I mean, we've gotten back to a place in movies where we can be on an airplane without talking about that. Sure. And then to see that, I mean, had we watched this six years ago, it would be really weird yeah. the way they treat air travel. And now it's kind of coming back to, to normalcy a little bit. It's reassuring. Uh, we get some explosive decompression shortly after in that yeah. scene. Uh, what's up with explosive decompression? It not real. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, not a thing that happens. Unfortunately, explosive decompression was busted. Yeah, a plane ripping in half and sucking people out the... Um, out the side there, but that's how you see it happen. Sure. In movies and final destination. I mean, it's 
it plays, uh, let's say, fast and loose with physics. Yes, yeah, that's true. Uh, but that's where you want it to be. Yep. You want things to be as gory as they can make them. Uh, you want the plane to rip apart, that wreckage to be a, a fucking disaster. And, you know, my concern, and this happens throughout the, the, all of the movies, is that we always see this premonition in the beginning. And then uh, the actual event happens. Mm -hmm. And as we're watching that in the first movie, I'm going, well, the plane's going to blow up from the outside. Is this going to be as awesome? Yeah. There's no way it's going to be. And it almost becomes funny later on. Sure. The way that it's like a a big, terrible event. And then, oh, no, a terrible event's going to happen. Let's walk over here and watch it happen in the background. Well, that's one of the things that came to be my favorite part of the Final Destination series is what happens in the beginning. Which is the premonition where people just get slaughtered, yep. and then you get to hang out with them for the rest of the movie after having seen it. It, it kind of fulfills the need. It's like when you meet somebody new, uh-huh. and for whatever reason, all you can think is, I want to see you naked. Sure. So it'd be like if you met somebody new, saw them naked in the first five minutes, and then were to continue a relationship with them, and then later on see them naked again and have sex with them. I can think of so many problems with this comparison. My point was that the uh, the moment the plane blows up from the outside, it's still awesome. I think it's the the glass shatter that makes it. <laughs> yeah, the airport. Basically I don't know if that ever wave. happens uh, again in the whole franchise, where it still feels it feels just as great. And then we move into uh, what feels a little bit more like the terminal, uh, just this kind of trapped in one place yeah. movie, where we get the uh, the eye shine testimonials and that stuff. I was starting to think, I don't know why, because I don't think about these things at all as they're happening, that this might be uh, a whole movie that takes place on a plane, <laughs> which would be bizarre given the concept of Final right. Destination. A bunch of people well, narrowly... Well, they do have to get somewhere eventually. Yeah, yeah, right. Thank you. The uh, The idea of narrowly avoiding death uh, on a plane... Right. I mean, how many traps could you really... It's just the trade table. Yeah. Right? Over and over, That's it true. would just be the trade table. But it isn't too long before the, you know, the kills kick in. Sure. And uh, the first one we see in the entire franchise is the bathroom. The first sort of uh, fate trap. Right, yeah. It makes me wonder, right from the start, do you think Final Destination has a sense of humor about itself? I definitely don't know when it got a sense of humor about itself. but It it certainly does by the end. By the end, it definitely has. I think, no, I think it does. I think right off the bat. So here's the first trap. I mean, is it... There's a guy dying in the bathroom, slipping. I Slipping on soapy water and choking to death on the clothesline. Right. It seems to be one of the more serious ones, but the way the movie plays with how is he going to die, which thing is going to happen, there's a dark humor element to that. Yeah. Juxtaposed against how quiet and still, and and a tiny bit funny, I I suppose, the rest of the movie uh, is. You have these death scenes, and then you just have this stillness. The rest of the t- it's kind of surreal. Yeah. The very minimal score, if any score in a lot of these scenes, just people talking and treating things pretty heavy. It's like Final Destination is just wearing a straight face yeah. the entire time. And then Tony Todd shows yeah. up. Yeah. Oh my God, Tony Todd. Thank you. It's really, it's perfect because that's how I feel about Tony Todd. Mm-hmm. He's quiet. He's still. He's got gravity. And he's just a little bit funny. Yep. Just a little bit. Are you fucking kidding me, Tony Todd? Yeah. Like, he thinks everything he's saying is a big fucking joke. Yeah. His level of intensity, it just circles the spectrum and ends back at a place of complete parody of itself. Sure, sure, it's yeah. absolutely bizarre. But, I mean, I always go back to Hatchet when he was mm-hmm. in Hatchet. Yeah. Um, and the delivery of uh, why he doesn't do Swamp Tours anymore. Right. Um, right. That story is so grave. Yeah, But sure. it's all just a fucking joke. Yeah, you just want to say to him, "Are you fucking with me yeah. right now?" I can't. I can't tell. It, it's what makes him one of my favorites. As we're making the rounds and then kind of learning all the the components of what'll set this franchise up, there's uh, another one that I think probably appeals to our audience in particular. Um, our our female actress here talking about. Uh, she says she says it's total bullshit. First of yeah. all, she sounds just like Rebecca mm-hmm. when she says it. I had to do a double take. Uh, But she starts talking, you know, they're laying out everything that's going on. This unbelievable uh, fate's following us around and killing us. And uh, we got to look for signs. And she points out that coffee starts with C and ends with E and starts to go on this, you know, this long tangent about 
It's like the uh, the terror alert system. Yeah. You know, speaking of nine eleven, okay, we're on orange alert. So be more alert. Oh, what the fuck does that mean? Yeah. What are you supposed to do? Right. So look around everywhere for signs. You could just make anything into a sign. Is her point? And the movie, and I love this. The movie brings it up as if to say, "Oh, we're aware of that. We're going to ignore you because that's not fun. Uh-huh. We're just totally glossing yeah. over that." There, there's every every. I think it's in every odd numbered movie. There's a character that comes in and goes, come on, guys. Are you fucking kidding me? I kind of feel like it might be every movie. Yeah. Right? Just a, at least a dose of it. But they completely ignore her. Yeah, that's nice. They play the Nine Inch Nails song. That's yeah, what they that's do. that's true. They immediately go to, and I was going to make a fucking throwaway reference to it, too. Yeah. Pictures in my head of the final destination. They had to use the titular yeah, line, it's so... Nine Inch Nails song. And what that are you whole doing, scene, movie? that whole scene ends with a bus. It's an incredibly memorable death. Yeah. That bus. Uh, you just if drop fucking dead. That's it. Bus, no. bam, done. Move on. And there's a humor in that. I think in the immediacy there. Sure. Although that's the nature of that death, whether you choose to find that humorous or not. That's how that's going to play. Probably mm-hmm. no matter. I mean, it's always going to be horrifying and a little funny. That sure. it just it provokes that out of you. It forces uh, yeah. kind of a giggle out of you. Uh, then they also have a death like the the catastrophic fire, computer liquid damage. Oh yeah, don't kind pour of water on your machinery. That's, yeah, that's just, really the beginning of don't pour water on your machinery. <laughs> right. It's a cautionary tale, uh-huh. these, uh, these movies. It's just blood fucking everywhere in that scene. I love it. But you remember how that ends. He walks out of the house. Oh, hey, Alex. House blows up. It's, uh, it's just a little bit funny. It's just got yeah. a little dark humor to it. The movies will, um, will start to have, they have rules that yeah. they're curious about. The people in the movie want to know the rules because they're in a dire situation that might help them. Well, their life is at stake. You, you want to know the rules of any game that ends with you dying. Yeah, and as you as a, an audience member start asking those rules, I think the movie gets to it pretty quickly sure. too. It's not a couple seconds after I start going, all right, I get the order thing. What if somebody dies out of order? How does that work? And then the movie immediately tackles that. Yep. It goes, oh, what, what if we start fucking up the, uh, the order? And I think there's this this kind of moment where skeptics' ears sort of perk up, if it wasn't at Rebecca Watson earlier, where uh, you know where they're talking about fate mm-hmm. and the idea that God's plan is God's plan. Um, but something that comes back around is uh, always this idea of, well, is that how fate had planned it the entire time? Right. If we, you know, if we don't do something one way, is that actually what fate wanted? Anyhow. It's one of those questions you can't really answer. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, God's plan is always God's plan. And even if it doesn't go the way God had planned it, he planned for it not to go that way. Right. You know, the new way is now God's plan. It's this, uh, I mean, it's the same with religion as it is yeah. with conspiracy. It's not testable. So it becomes a pointless hypothesis that they're even arguing mm-hmm. over. As if the discussion of this could ever lead anywhere. But it can't because it's kind of a moving goalpost. It's right. a... Um, I suppose it's a god of the gaps too. It's it's a lot of different sort of logical fallacies, but it's a moot point above anything else. Why talk about how fate had planned it, or try and anticipate fate, or look for clues if anything you do might have been part of fate's plan all along? And that's an idea that'll continue to come up. What I like is that I don't think the movie's just invoking this. I think it does have a little bit of a skeptical bent to it. Yeah, you know, like when you look at the end. He keeps making up these rules, thinking he knows how it works, our protagonist mm-hmm. here. He's constantly coming up with stuff, just making it up out of whole cloth. Oh, this is how it is, you guys. I know the rules. And uh, there's really no system of logic, no reason for it. And it turns out he doesn't know how it works. I mean, the ending of the movie proves that. Yeah, well, and the beginning of the, the following movie also proves that he has no idea how it works because he was felled by a brick. I guess that is our chapter marker. <laughs> Yeah, these are ideas that keep the audience uh, guessing. I guess uh, more than uh, just keeping the audience guessing, it keeps them questioning, mm-hmm. which is you know important to this franchise. So when we get to the second movie, now it's David R. Ellis doing the directing. It's uh, maybe three years later. Okay. And uh, I don't know David Ellis from a lot of stuff, but I know he did Snakes on a Plane. Oh. Which uh, you tried to get me to see a long time ago, and somehow I still haven't gotten mm. around to. I don't. Snakes on a Plane. That smells like, uh, it smells like year five to me. Yeah, I don't know why we haven't done Snakes on a Plane, 
I, I like that we're at a point in the show where I don't go, why haven't I seen snakes on a plane? I just go, why haven't I put that on the show? Yeah. Never seen it. Don't understand. It's, uh, man, this is just a marvelous opening road scene. Oh my God. I fucking love that. It kicks off with this. I mean, the log battering ram kill mm-hmm. is throughout the franchise still one of my favorites. Yeah. Just uh, smearing fucking human being through the back yeah. of the windshield. Just cop brains all it, over. The, it's violent and slow and devastating. The whole thing's great. The whole pileup scene. It's it's amazing because you realize how wide your mouth can really get because you never get a chance to close your mouth. Sure. Because the next thing is already happening. Yeah, it's a gape the entire time. <clears throat> What's well, the point where I realize what Final Destination is? Or at the very least, if not that, what I want it to be. I want the quiet moments. I want to go slowly about our lives. And then I want to reach occasional brutal traps like this. Um, and I love that every single movie opens with a, a show-off piece, really. Yeah. A fucking show off piece. Look, this is what you are in store for. This is what you signed up for. That's no heavy cannon, no real slasher, just the the core basics of what we come to these movies for, anyways. Especially after you and I just did a franchise like Saw. Yeah. You know, for a movie that uh I mean, this is a movie that almost has traps. We've been using the word traps sure. to describe them. But it's not similar in no. the least. I don't even think they're Rube you could... Goldberg. They're little Rube Goldberg yeah. events that yeah, fate right. is weaving based on right. whatever horrifically dangerous situation the characters decide is a good idea to be in. Yeah, the Goldberg thing is perfect. I mean, it's these chain reaction, these chain event deaths. Um, you know, take the take one of the last ones. I guess I can't call it the last one, but the log punctures the tank and the fuel leaks down the drain, and uh, and then the girl drops the cigarette. It's that kind of chain reaction that the Final Destination movies almost become known for sure. um, that make people think about the what ifs in the movie. It lends itself very well to to one of the central themes. Uh, if we had never done this, would these people have lived? Mm-hmm. You know, the very deaths do that as well. If this girl hadn't dropped this cigarette, that guy would still be alive. Sure, it's a, it's like a macro version of you know, in a broader sense, when they're talking about. Had I not journeyed here or done this or caused this to happen, would these people still exist? So it, uh, it almost becomes a metaphor in that way. It's, um, it's those kind of chains that are a, a theme of the franchise. Sure. Well, especially in this film, they bring it up as a ripple effect where you realize yeah. all of these characters are only alive because of the plane crash from right. the first movie. Right. And they've all been affected by the individual deaths from those characters. And now death is trying to right itself. Sure. And it gets really contrived and confusing, but it doesn't make it any less fun. It almost makes it more fun. I think it does. Because I really think it does. You just pretend that it makes sense, and then sure. when they die, it has some sort of galactic equilibrium. Sure, it ties together some things uh, to be related that you didn't even need. To right, be exactly. Related. Unnecessary, completely. Um, you know, we have that opening scene, and it turns out it's not her friends we're following around, mm-hmm. and I love that about it. You think you have your little pack, all those people die. And so then you find out all these other people are related to the the earlier one. Right. And that lets you play with the rules a little bit more. It lets you play more of those experiments in your head. And Allie Larder's back, which I'm totally a fan of. (laughs) It kind of makes it a woman's game now, which I really like that about it. I think Final Destination 2 might be one of my favorites for that reason, that you have these uh, this kind of dynamic between these two girls uh, leading everybody else, that she makes it over from the last film. Allie's from, uh, she was in the show Heroes. She was really great in that. Um, Some of the early hero stuff is really Mm -hmm. good. And she just makes such a good lead. You didn't realize the, this is starting to sound like some of our other franchises, but (laughs) you didn't realize the potential she might have had. Sure. She was very doughy-eyed in the first movie, and now she is hardened by the awful things that have happened. It's bringing that actress back, but almost giving her an entirely different role to play. Yeah. Because, you know, a brick didn't. (laughs) <laughs> a fucking brick man i mean how ridiculous is I that i love that i oh, hope that it's, it's all got something to do with like devon sawa not wanting to re-sign for another so they, FD, they, give him so a, they kill him an in embarrassing the most death. embarrassing way possible oh, god the uh the best way to go is that incubus kitchen fire yeah that thing is great that track just fucking rocks that whole 
uh, the oil fire and the, um, I think he was making breakfast tacos. Yeah, is something like probably. that. Probably. Uh, you and I have known each other for uh, 95 years. Mm-hmm. And I, I just realized this today. I was so excited about it. I burnt myself in a horrendous oil fire that, let's say, looked just like this film. Yeah. Uh, making you Robert Rodriguez's Sin City Breakfast Tacos one yeah. day. Yeah. Long, long, long time ago. And the story always made me angry because uh, on my beautiful pale hands, I uh, I look like I've never worked a day in my life except that one fucking oil burn. And I just noticed today it's not there anymore. Well, there you are. Hooray, 10 years goddamn <laughs> later. So this guy, there's the fire that's fucking everywhere and the uh, the ending that's arbitrary, but uh, really but vicious. Just bam, I suck it. The thing that I love about uh, about this compared to some of these other deaths is it feels like, you know, he's really doing battle here. He's got a, a setup where he can take, he's not a, a victim. This isn't the dentist's office so right. much where he's just locked down and death is going to happen to him. He's got some breathing room here mm-hmm. and he's going to fucking go toe to toe and he loses in a miserable way, <laughs> in a miserable, quick, simplistic way. That's why you don't want it to happen in the dentist's office, though. You know, you're you're tied down. It's not your domain yeah. like it is in your home. It's it's just so much more unfair. But that dentist's office is that you could see the writer's brain start moving. Sure. Where don't people want this to right. happen? Dentist's office. And people don't like the dentist. Yeah. Well, and the that was the beginning. Oh no, it wasn't the beginning of pigeons. It was just a second chapter of pigeons. Pigeons, I mean, that's the that's the point where I'm going, you have to be fucking kidding yeah. me. Pigeons are also a reoccurring motif yeah, in this series. For some reason. Don't know why. They, we never know why. Because they they're the disease ridden and they're the harbingers of death. God, because they're fucking absurd. Because they're Tony <laughs> Todd's straight face. Yeah. Where you see pigeons and you go, are you fucking with me right now? <laughs> Mr. Todd comes back, but now he's super magic, right? Yeah. They give him a lot more gravity. He's got his own layer at this point. He is the magic Negro of this series. Well, of this, he's one of them. Yeah, that's true. There are plenty of magic Negroes throughout Final Destination. We've talked about that concept a a little bit before, I think. Yeah. But it's this almost kind of racist idea. It's not kind of racist. You think it's just purely racist? It's pretty fucking racist. uh, What's your take on the magic Negro? How would you explain that? The magic Negro is, um, it's a character that shows up in literature or, and now film, uh, where it's a uh, uneducated black character who comes in and has the insight that changes the downtrodden white character's fate. Sure. Um, it's simple not simple nec- job. They always have a simple. It's Hud yeah. Sucker proxy. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's not. They don't necessarily have magic. Right. But they are the turning point in the actual care the actual sure. leads life, and sure. they have this this little grain of insight into how they should handle their problem. It's disguised as being not racist because they have magical powers. Yeah. So it seems like that that's a total you forfeit, token character. You, yeah, you forfeit your civil rights for <laughs> sure. magic. Sure. Which yeah. sometimes I would consider that. Well, it's kind of a it seems like a, a pat on the back kind of Yeah, a pat ext- down extremely. On the back. Well, you know, it's saying, okay, this man's uneducated, but if people only paid attention to him, they would realize that he really is his vast tome of knowledge. Yeah, something Good like that. Good for you, black man. Yeah, you're right. It's just totally racist character. I want to talk about Final Destination 3, but we can't, uh, we can't end 2 without talking about that plate glass kill, which is one of those Final Destination kills that, along with the bus, I mean, it goes on the top 10 list. Yeah. You know, just flattening. We start to get a lot of that throughout the series. Yeah. It's like Jason and the fucking harpoon. We just <laughs> realize that's one of them, and people love that one, and let's call back to it. So we just flatten people. all Because that's a devastating way to go. Yeah. You, you can't fight. It goes back to the, the fucking incubus thing, the oil fire. Sometimes you can fight back, and sometimes you can't. Yep. If a thing falls on you, and you just get squished, you had no hope. It's immediate. It's over. Uh, you're done. Remember that kill forever. That and the barbecue explosion. Barbecue explosion. Is... Which kind of begins the... I mean, I guess it was in the last movie, too. Sure. But it begins the... We're going to open kicking ass, and we're going to end kicking yep. ass. Bring up the metal. So Final Destination 3 was the one that I had seen. I had not seen any of these other films except oh, FD3. And and it's still one of my favorites. Yeah, right. Um, 
FD3 is the carnival, the roller coaster. Yeah, it's the Mary Elizabeth Winstead yeah, movie, too. she's so good in this. Yeah, she really is. Oh, my God. Yeah, that and the carnival put together, it does make this one of the best ones. Right, well, and it has that cute little um, Abraham Lincoln gimmick where sure, she's sure. taking pictures for the school yearbook while the whole class is at the carnival, so... God, I think about that as another pigeon moment. Right. She whips out a picture of Abraham Lincoln, and I'm just thinking, what the fuck? I was I was literally confused. I had to ask you what the fuck she was doing Well, because of how absurd that was. The photo of former President Lincoln yeah. had a little crease at the top of his head, oh, which is to let you know that it was faded, that he was to be assassinated by being shot in the head. If and this, only we had looked at the picture, Michael, this, we would have known. This translates to two other things. It translates, one, to the rest of Final Destination 3, where... Sure. All of the photos of her friends, whether or not they have an Asian girl's camel toe in them, oh God. also have some sort of foreshadowing how they're going to die. Right. Um, buried deep within the background sure, of the sure. image. And it's usually the blurry section. Yeah. Uh, the other thing that it predicted was that a shadow on the World Trade Center meant we all should have seen 9-11 coming. I don't know how we didn't see it. It's insane. She sounds like an insane woman. <laughs> but it's a new gimmick that they haven't brought in, and it kind of makes it fun because it does. Yeah, it allows the characters to be wrong. And yeah, the right. the one uh, the moment, and it's the most memorable kill in all of Final Destination for me is when she's looking at the photo of that skeevy dude with the with the play with the playgirl yeah, chain. Right. Sure, and she can't figure I think that's out. It's just a Playboy chain, isn't it? I don't know. I don't I, think it's Playboy at all. I just I think don't it's know what that some is. trucker babe. Okay. Yeah. Um, and she can't figure out how he's going to die involving a rope ladder. Right. And then he gets his head eaten by <laughs> a car engine. Sure. And then she goes, oh, it's this picture yeah. with the fan. Yeah, right. And I just love that they spend a good 15 minutes of the film trying to go, how is a rope ladder going to kill this guy? Yeah. I don't, I can't figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anytime the characters are dead fucking wrong. Yeah, it's oh, beautiful. It's the best. It's the best. It's again, to go back to that skepticism. Yeah. To think uh, we're infallible and we know the rules and you're wrong. Well, yeah. And that's the thing is the rules, while they're explained and while we have some semblance of an idea of the rules, we're only gauging it based on what the characters have discovered and sure. then how that plays out. Sure. We don't actually have the written dogma of final destination yeah. there is no 10 commandments of fate only tony todd has that yeah. he doesn't want to reveal them all <laughs> till the last movie the uh he's what the ride in this movie he's yeah. the the dragony whatever that is demon big red demon yeah thing. he's the big red demon voice way to bring back tony todd three goddamn films in a row like it matters they're just gonna <laughs> put his voice right in there it doesn't really make any any sense no but i doesn't matter still awesome. tony todd is the voice of satan that's that or Paul Giamatti. Those are my options. You know, the movie starts, this gets a, a stylized open. It's uh, mm -hmm. it's not the most stylish open no. of, of all the films, but it starts with a Rude Goldberg pinball kind of opening. It's uh, invoking those chain reactions. Right. Again, just setting you up to kind of think about that. And then directly into the carnival to give you a backdrop, a place I never want to leave. Yeah. I, I fucking love that carnival with its silly three-point lighting that seems to mm -hmm. exist floating around every character's head. That's I, I. That's almost pornographic to me. Yeah. If I could find a carnival to go to where a crew followed all of my friends around and lit them that way for uh, for the entire thing, and then we took a commercial break sure. together. Yeah. What's with the commercial break. There's, this is definitely a Sunday afternoon. Sometimes movies have commercial breaks yeah. built right into them. Well, the other thing that makes this seem kind of like a weekend TV special mm -hmm. is that. Um, I, I'm going to use air quotes here. That goth character. Oh, yeah. He's so fucking straight out of Erie, Indiana. And yeah. it only gets better after his girlfriend gets nail gunned through the back of the head. Yep. And he becomes this dismal, brooding sure. portrait of me in high school. Oh, God. And uh, and I just love that the dynamic of Final Destination 3 resolves with one of the survivors deciding he is the fate. He is the hand yeah. Yeah. that will end this whole chain reaction. Sure. Occasionally they will try and personify that sure. fate a little bit, or they'll at least blame it on a character. Right. Yeah. I like, I, like, I like that. Blaming it on somebody is <laughs> well, far that's better. what it is. Yeah. Well, the whole, the whole thing about the final destination franchise is it's people scrambling. Yeah. That's, 
the baseline of what's sure, going on. Sure. People are dying and they're scrambling. Yeah, and so you pick somebody to beat as if that's your, your right. end goal. Sure. You'll beat that guy and then everything will be fine. Well, because your arms are too short to box with God. You <laughs> yeah. have to fucking pick on whoever seems to be, I guess, the one pulling the strings. I wish they would have picked on Lewis because that guy is a fucking dick. <laughs> it's fucking true. Oh, of all the characters movies want you to hate, uh, Lewis is just a few things set me off in life. I know. Like, yeah, I know what you're going to say. Control that bitch. Control that bitch. That was oh. the. Did I ever tell you about the only fight I ever got to in my entire life? Oh, you got in a fight, Mr. Pacifist. Yeah, some kid when I was very young at a mall looking just like that guy from sure. the end. Of, right, when you were that kid. Um, he told me to control my woman oh god and i i didn't get into a fight on her behalf i told him that he could fight her if he right. wanted to right. that's the correct thing although not um, the, the and, typical or even safest thing and, to do and he said no and he hit me oh and, well no and, so that was your fight yeah you got hit i got hit oh that's fine that's me that's a path that's how pacifists fight they uh their right. their girlfriends get challenged their girlfriends don't want to fight she probably would have fought she was way 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 <laughs> rowdier than i was oh i knew this story actually yeah. i didn't yeah the uh the only people i've ever gotten into fights with have been women who punch me in the face or stab you so I've i heard. guess yeah that's another story for another killapalooza we'll do that on prom night you know this is one of those ideas we visited briefly during the uh the richard dawkins i think it was one of the root of all evil things mm -hmm. i don't remember but uh, that guy talking about how you dress your women, just Ugh. as if they, I don't need to explain I don't like the fucking, just, just the two word phrase, your woman. Yeah, right, right. Done, fail, oh, get God, out of I my know. life. I know, it's already the worst thing ever. And then just asking the control, oh, okay, moving on. Let's talk about naked girls getting shredded by glass. That's oh, better. Love Actually, it. that's the, the kind of thing that probably gets me punched in the face. <laughs> Uh, I think these two girls being shredded up and then uh, burned alive sure. is probably this new level of fucked up for this series. Yeah, no, the the series is constantly grabbing for the next thing that's going to yeah. really get you out of your seat. And they never fail. No, it's they don't. Always, they always manage to improve. Well, up to now it's violent, but being burned alive is the first time I think the series actually borders on fucked up. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't play in that arena a whole lot, but when we start to get to eyeball it, stuff Yeah, later it becomes and, sadism. Yeah, it I does. I mean, the film is jerking off, and you're watching it jerk off. Right. And that's what's fucked up. It's true. It's a jerk-off tour of, uh, you know, hazardous areas, wherever their adventure takes you. We have an understanding of Final Destination yeah. unparalleled it's, by uh, anybody in the film world. I feel I like honestly it's speaking believe that. directly to me. I think you're dead on. What's funny about this movie is that uh, with the previous movies where they're kind of getting inside your head and uh -huh. they're doing the thing where it goes, you know, you think, oh, well, why don't you just go in a, in a mental ward or why don't you just lock yourself in this room and eat your yogurt? You know, this is how I would stay alive. This movie doesn't even play that game. There is no attempt to stay safe. They go to a carnival. They go to a hardware store. They go to the fucking fireworks show. Yeah. I mean, they're pretty much taking a tour of the most dangerous places in their crappy little town. And uh, ending on the train with that fucking train carnage scene, just the blood smeared everywhere. And I mean, it's the kind of kills that Final Destination is best at, the uh, the immediate variety, yeah. where it's just, uh, there's no torture like our other slashers, where we draw out some of the kills, mm -hmm. we leave you, you know that position your body locks in when you get a cringe moment and it kind of stays there for a while? I'm recalling yeah. the seventh Saw film. Well, and Eli Roth is, is really great at those, yeah. too. Um, these are a lot different, for the most part. These kills are just snap, pop, immediate. They're, they're just shockers. Yeah, they're, it's shock value. It's, uh, it's amazing, fun, yeah. inventive shock value. All right, it's been a couple of years. Time to reinvent the entire franchise. Yeah, well, not entirely, because we still get uh, the old director back. Yeah, that's not reinventing the franchise, I don't think. <laughs> It's uh, it's David R. Ellis sure. doing the fourth one. Right. So we've been alternating now between uh, between James right. and David. But this is the final destination. There will be no more final destinations. This is the final, final destination. Yeah, it's somewhere between a reboot and this is the last one. Sure. 
And so it does that thing that last movies do where it tries to pay some tribute uh-huh. uh, with this opening title sequence. Oh, my God. Just a big congratulations. Well, you were talking about Jason 10 earlier. Yeah. Just a big fucking congratulations. Yeah. Thanks for watching our movies. We really appreciate it. Here you go. It's just anatomical x-rays of all of the trauma that happened to anybody who was killed in yeah. the previous three Final Destination oh, it's films. beautiful, man. It feels so good. It's so much fun. And then you go straight to NASCAR, which is just, I guess, where you need to go. What's more exciting than NASCAR in 3D? Uh, Rom-coms in 3D? Oh, my God. Uh, Love Lays Dying, I think, is the... <laughs> it doesn't look like a romantic comedy It to is, me. though. They bring up this idea of a chick flick in 3D. And it's not X-rated. Like, I can, th- I can see an X-rated chick flick in 3D. Sure. But this is... Well, I, again, from what we see of the movie, it's an action movie it's yeah. not a chick flick they're probably just making fun of it that way he's saying oh yeah that looks like a chick flick sure as if to say you know oh that guy who kicks all the time instead of punching his movies are weaker than everybody else's movies i love the idea of a chick flick in 3d for as much as i hate 3d i think that just says we've hit the point of oversaturation we don't care anymore um we've been in the the arena of 3d for so long that. You know, when people say they don't want the 3D in their movie or in a movie they go see to be obnoxious, I think they mean this movie. Yeah. This just reeks of early era 3D. Well, it does that thing with 3D that they quickly divorce themselves from. Sure. Which is shots, um, characteristically, the shot where that mechanic falls on the wooden plank and it comes out his mouth. Sure. We're sitting here watching it on your HD television that is in regular D. Right. The regular amount of D. Two dimensions. Missing one. There we go. Um, But the thing is, is the shot is right over his fucking face. Yeah. And so when the thing comes out of his mouth, he just kind of opens his mouth and you see a red thing in it. Yeah. But you really have to stretch your imagination to go, that's coming out of there. Sure. And not that's in his mouth. Yeah. The angles, the shoot these scenes on are, are really bizarre because they want stuff coming directly at you. As opposed to the kind of two-thirds angle that movies shoot uh, really like a a majority of their stuff on. And things will just pointlessly fly at the screen, too. That's how you know it's 3D. And the things that fly at the screen look like fucking Acme cartoons. Right. Well, with little to no prep, I would assume that the last two movies are in 3D. Just based on how many things fly at the goddamn (laughs) screen. The movie goes on to comment about 3D. So this was at the height of... People love it. People hate it. Oh, love it or hate it. Come sure. see, you know, the new Final Destination movie. Yeah. And just now we've gotten to a point where we could actually have chick flicks in 3D. I was. I. I just. I can't get my head around why everything's not in 3D. It should be all or nothing. <laughs> you I think don't, so? I just, you just don't want fucking pleats. I don't fucking care. Right. Anymore. I'm not. Honestly, I don't go to see films because of the amount of dimensions. The amount of dimensions that I'm paying for when I go to the ticket has to be more than one. I've seen films in 2, 3, and 4D in the theater, and they vary based on the actual content of the film and not the amount of Ds that I'm seeing or smelling. You are referencing, I assume, Spy Kids? Spy Kids 4. And not Piranha. That was great. There's different amounts of Ds different amounts of D. In, in different ways. Oh, actually, Piranha's going to actually have an all-new different type of D when uh, Piranha 3 Double D comes That's out. That's what I was talking about. That's I don't know where that fits on the D scale. Why are we still talking about this? Boobs. You're full of it. I know what actually brings you to these movies. Okay. And that is, well, I, I suppose it is boobs. But uh, <laughs> the massive deaths that this movie promises. Honestly, that is it. If you just get a list of how many characters are going to die in each movie... If I perform this experiment where I said I have five films and in one of them, twice as many people die, you'd go, great, let's watch that one. Okay, actual real life experiment. Uh-huh. I saw a list when The Expendables came out, the first one. Sure. Um, and it was about all of the different action heroes and stars that were in the, in the Avengers, that were in The Expendables, and it had a list of their films and the body count for each film. Right. I went through and watched just the films with the highest body counts. Of course you did. I didn't, of course you did. I didn't pay any attention. How to well do I know you that that I, is actually a thing that happened? Yeah. Of course. We, we have to have all these mass deaths because of the opening NASCAR scene. Yeah. It's like a buffet, man. It is. It just says, hey, have you seen these franchises before? All right, well, look at all of these characters. What do you think is going to happen to them? <laughs> what I love about that opening NASCAR scene, unlike the other opening scenes, 
is there's total mayhem. Yeah. Unlike the previous ones, there's about six to eight characters who die very specifically and you see them each die. Yeah. This, there's about 50 people and they just all get crushed and burned and sliced sure. open. But then when he wakes up from his premonition, about seven people get out right. of the actual arena and the rest die in the arena. Sure. Which is sure. a really brilliant way to go. You know, it's not just when everybody in question escapes. It's a slightly different take on the funny scene at yeah. the end of every premonition yeah. where they go, oh, we should just. We should walk out, huh? Yeah. Oh, look at all that stuff happening back there. Yep. You actually need to keep paying attention and and tabulates who uh, who stayed behind and sure. who we're not going to have to worry about for the rest of the and movie. And even so, when a tire comes flying, your count is immediately changed. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, there's the tire death. There's the the bus callback that uh, yeah. that the movie does. Um, the movie also experiments with the idea of breaking the chain. I think that. Uh, This is something that I've kind of just ignored up to that point because it confuses me. Mm -hmm. And now this film says, uh, you know, a big part of our plot is going to be the fact that, yeah, it's confusing. No one knows how the chain works. Mm -hmm. Does breaking the chain do anything? What are the rules here? They go back to that original idea of, oh, we don't really know the rules. Yeah. This isn't Scream. This is how it differentiates itself from Scream, which is, aha, here are the rules of horror. This movie says, uh, we, we have no clue what our rules are. Someone help us. And Tony Todd is nowhere to be found in no this Tony film. Todd so this what the time. fuck are they going to do? The only magic Negro is Chicago Wind from Black Dynamite. I'll take it. So maybe we never really got to the bottom of that. And maybe we still don't get to the bottom of breaking the chain. And no. What that, what that well, means. and this, the other thing other than breaking the chain that they really get in depth of is right at the end where they go back to that thing from the first movie that you were talking about where... Sure. It's, you know, the extrapolation of how far ahead fate can plan. Right. You know, double thinking, triple thinking, reverse psychology, sure. reverse, reverse psychology. Right. If right. we do this, are we playing into the plan that fate had all along? Yeah. Maybe fate wanted us to be sitting at this cafe. Right. And then a truck comes through the fucking window. Sure. And it's right back to that goddamn 3D anatomical yeah. crush fest. That post Magic Negro, uh, <laughs> Mortal Kombat, you know, yeah. Mortal Kombat X Ray, I guess. And that's after we didn't mention the sprinkler system uh, oh, a yeah. bit. The thing that makes me fucking nuts about the sprinkler system. So he's laying there and he's trying to get the the sprinklers to go off. Uh-huh. Uh, everything's on fire. We're continuing our water motif. The the whole sure. uh, just a PSA on water turns out is bad for electronics. Yeah. It's not covered by your warranty. You just got to be, you got to be careful around that. Other really important thing is flammable liquids are flammable. Uh, That is true. That is true. And they will inevitably leak towards you. Yeah. They're magnetically drawn towards you. So the sprinkler system saves the day, but it doesn't go off unless the system itself is on fire, which is a unique uh, model of sprinkler (laughs) I was not aware of. It's it's one of those time saving uh, sprinklers. So if the uh, if the room is just floor to ceiling flame, that's when the sprinkler right. is trying to save water, I guess. And and that's where we get another nail gun. There, I really like seeing the nail gun Can't get show up. Of those. But I think the most strange kill, and you noted it when we were watching it, mm. was when she gets caught in the escalator. Yeah, right. And they painstakingly show you each section of her body being ground in between these fucking escalator gears right right. it's the only time in pretty much the entire franchise where maybe save the tanning beds yeah where we watch the painstaking sadistic demise of a character we love yeah and it's not shock something's through their mouth they're dead don't worry move on sure he's trying to save her for the entirety of her body being ground into fucking paper yeah i guess that really is the most brutal one there's a couple i can think about but even the way it ends i mean it's still immediate slice and moving on doesn't lose its uh its signature at all so the most recent final destination then is five skull uh yeah five the, skull which it's still called final destination five right but the poster was called five skull yeah it's just a big skull it's a five giant <laughs> five we're supposed to know what the fuck that is the uh i, guess I would have known had i been paying attention to these films i would have shit my pants seeing five skull you yeah, know what right, i mean right well it's not even using the same typeface as the other movies i would have known think. yeah it's saying we're an established franchise and you're thinking uh, i don't know hold on yeah. a second But it's funny after we were talking about Saw and how they, you know, they labeled them all with numbers except the goddamn last one. 
we actually make it through Final Destination doing one through five. Yep. Thanks, Final Destination. Uh, and the opening credits are, I mean, they took a page out of the last book. They yeah. said, uh, let's make the opening credits fucking awesome. Let's throw everything that killed people through some glass. Yeah, just one at a time. And it the music's all a, James Bondy. Yeah, I was just going to say, it's a fucking James Bond feel it's to it. It's beautiful. Yeah, it's really, really great. It's, um, uh, it's stylized in a completely different way, a much less metal kind of way yeah. than, than the last one. But still just fucking great. It feels darker uh, tonally. It's just got more of a serious love everything about it. This is Stephen Quayle doing uh, this movie. He's mm-hmm. the first one kind of new to the franchise sure. director wise. He uh, This is his first full length feature. I mean, he did second unit stuff on some Cameron pictures before this on uh, Avatar and on, I think, Titanic as huh. well. And so he comes into this with the opening credits, just winning us over, you know, completely right in the beginning. And then, uh, and then we get this bridge. Oh my God, the bridge. And so I'm worried at the beginning of this yeah. that it's a bit of a letdown. Well, the one thing that we were discussing is that the movies have gotten to the point where they start and we go, oh yeah, what's right. the disaster this time? Right, right. And Impress us. Please. We're sitting there going, can't do a car pile up. Yeah. Can't do a plane crash. Sure. Can't crash a roller coaster. Like, we're we're telling them what they can't do. I like and how you throw crash a roller coaster in, like, that's on the sure. same level as... <laughs> Whatever. And we're, we're basically... Because how many massive catastrophes can you really come up with that sure. don't involve driving a car? No, I hear that. Or an airplane. Yeah. Or a train. They even fucking blew their load on the train at the end of the third movie just for the shit of it. Sure, sure. And now there's a bridge. Yeah, and people are just falling in the water. <laughs> and I'm, I got to tell you, man, I'm super let down. Really? This is it? People are just going to fall in the water. I started let down, but you can attest that by the end, I was, I was a ball of nerves. Yeah, I <laughs> agree with you. Well, that's the thing is I'm thinking, oh, boring, falling in the water. And then a car falls on her and I'm thinking, well, there's, there's no blood, but mm-hmm. I guess I'll take it. But when the, the fucking wire bloodily whips the guy yeah. off the side of the bridge Ugh. just that smack instant final destination kill then i go well this could turn around sure well that's and immediately followed by the tarring it is yeah yeah the Ugh. again uh in terms of things that are kind of fucked up that final destination plays with i've never seen a reaction quite provoked from you <laughs> like the steel rods through the body though i for what 3d coming straight at you i thought that they all three of the I because they managed to get me into a place where I forgot it was a premonition. Yeah, and I was thinking these are the three leads, so mm-hmm. these are the people that survive. Sure, and then they start killing off these characters, and they kill off both of the the male leads, one of which I know was having the premonition. Right. So at that point, I'm real fucking confused because I didn't know who was having the premonition. I knew it was one of them. Sure, that's the other guess is oh, who's going to have the premonition? Sure. Yeah, and it turns out somebody actually from the premonition survives for the first time ever. Not, yeah. not the most innovative thing I've ever heard of in my life. Certainly high on the list for final destination. Right. I mean, you can't argue it. It was right after rod guy fell over and splatted on the pavement. I mean, there are things that these movies do and there are things that these movies do not give a fuck about. And, uh, I think you look to the first and not the second. Yeah. You look to the uh, the leg splint ragdoll Jim drops. Of My the franchise. favorite fucking death. How many of these are you going to say that about? This is my favorite. Is it really? Yeah. Yeah. My favorite death in the Final Destination oh, franchise. she could have a tack in her foot. Oh, no, a screw in her right? foot. That might be She's bad. She's going to get electrocuted. I hope she doesn't hurt herself. Yeah, right. Ah, just her body bends over the. Oh, that's, num- her. that's number one for sure. Oh, uh. Oh, wow. nightmarish. Can we talk about kill substitution here? Yes. Let's let's dive back into mythology whenever we get a chance to. Tony Todd comes back. Returns. Uh, Tony Todd comes back in a super big way. The The movie um, uh, pretends that it's all about Tony Todd. Mm-hmm. Uh, kind of. I mean, he comes sure. back a lot. He doesn't just have his one scene. And he's the one who introduces this idea of kill substitution. Sure. Uh, he tells us this in the same way that they recap previous films. They go, oh, in case you haven't seen the last four films, the way you win, the way you get out of this is you sacrifice other people. Yeah. Uh, Sacrificial lambs. That has not been in these movies. He is making this rule up, uh, maybe to fuck with them, because that's what Tony Todd does. Uh 
I don't think to fuck with him, but uh, a possibility. Sure. Nonetheless. So what's the idea now that you can kill somebody and kill, then you don't die? If you, well, it's, it's more specific than that. If you kill somebody, you acquire their lifetime. Okay. They die in your stead and you acquire the amount of time that they would have lived X amount of years after you killed them, right. which is why the one character upon finding out that his coworker had a large brain vessel yeah, sure. Gets crushed by the plane from Donnie Darko. Yeah, it's not he would have died anyways. Right. It's uh, he didn't have very much, very much time left. Yeah, the character with no time is the one who introduces survivor's guilt, which I was kind of surprised about. Uh, surprised just to see him in the in the movie in right. general. But uh, I don't know how we got through five movies without talking about survivor's guilt. I think at all. the way you get through those five movies is you're terrified. Yeah. You don't have the time. This is the first film with the pacing that allows for conversational discussion of what's going on. Sure. That's true. That's true. But when we look at things in the in the Rosemary's Baby uh, manner of mm-hmm. what is scaring people about these movies. I see a lot of Rosemary's Baby in the fifth film. I know that's Do blasphemous you? because it's a Final Destination movie and people sure. have a fucking stick up their ass about everything. Yeah, right. But Rosemary's Baby is very similar to Final Destination 5 and you can all go fuck yourselves if you hate me for it. Well, when we were talking on that show about things of the era, uh, zeitgeist stuff, yeah, you know, what scares people? Why do they go to the movie? Why do they make a movie like this? Um, obviously, fate is one of the big ideas. Can you avoid fate? Is it predetermined for you? Fate and free will, uh, as interesting topics for definitely not this show, are, it's, it's one of those weird ideas where we know that God hasn't predetermined everything mm-hmm. because there is no God. So not too worried about that. But then you think, all right, we have this free will. Chemically, though, we make decisions based on our biology since we also have no soul. Sure. So I find that even as an atheist and someone who doesn't believe in the woo, this, uh, this back and forth argument of you know, how layered does the argument for or against fate, how deep does that go? Are you biologically determined to do everything you're going to do? Uh, do two people interact a certain way just because that's kind of how they're they're hardwired? And so survivor's guilt is another thing that I think is kind of in the background. It's kind of, look, all these people died, and now you, you feel guilty for it. Mm-hmm. Maybe not that you caused it, but in a weird way, that's almost more... I, th- I think the franchise leans on it a lot less, but that's more at the front of what drives a lot of the plot. Sure, uh, Those beginning moments are always... You know, did we cause that? That's the central thing. Did we cause this? Uh, it it weaves right in with the fate component. Right. Are the decisions we were making? Did other people die as a result of that? Sure. Did I indirectly kill people. Well, they they. I mean, they touch on that in another way in this film when the one character gets angry that he saved his girlfriend in the premonition. Sure. And he's all, well, why did she deserve to live and right. I deserve to die? Right. That's just another version of what kind of power you play in a catastrophe. Yeah. What steps you could have taken to save more or different people. Yeah, maybe I could have saved more. You know, that's uh, that's another component of survivor's guilt. Just a reoccurring motif, much like, um, I, I don't know, Paris would uh, would be throughout the movies or 180. Yeah. Paris was going to fucking Paris for some reason. Paris was a really interesting motif, especially in this film. Fuck you, Paris. Of the, actually, the headier ideas that the movie toys around with, that thing you you touched on briefly, that people, um, the the humanism element, yeah. saving people or people not deserving to die. One of our characters, who ends up being our villain, comes to that realization. It's a it's a particularly strange scene because he comes out and he says, "Well, why does you know I was going to kill somebody because that's what you you do? It's sacrificial lamb thing we talked about, mm-hmm. uh, so that I could survive. But why does she deserve to die? You know, neither of us deserve to die." And it, it comes to this great humanistic moment. People don't deserve to die. Anyone. Nobody deserves to die. And he gives this impassioned humanistic speech. And then he decides to kill Molly for basically no reason. Right. What makes you deserve to live? So we got to a point where we thought almost a, uh, a Pilkington level of sure. uh, profound, you know, something this guy was delivering Profound here. inanity is what I like to call it. Sure, that works. And then you realize, oh no, he's just fucking psycho. Right. There's nothing. This just accidentally came out. He is uh, a drunkard trying to weave poetry. If none of us deserve to live or die, then why do it? It's 
it's up there with the lesser of two evils, something that could drive normal people to become evil, normally good people to become right. evil. Uh, crazy is another one of those yeah. things. Not the lesser of two evils. He's not stuck in a, in a philosophical corner. Sure. There. He's just fucking nuts by yep. the end of this movie. Becomes a bad guy. So all that's well and good, and yeah, nice little talking points for the movie, but I don't care about any of that fucking well, stuff. Well, going back to Paris, there is one thing you care about, there and is... it's that he's got an inter- oh, or he's God. got a job in Paris that the entire time in the film, they're debating whether or not he's going to fly to Paris. Right. And then you realize that flying to Paris is a familiar circumstance oh. in the Final Destination series. This debate he's having is everything we've been talking about, man. <laughs> the whole movie is its just bringing back another layer, maybe something you don't even realize. So at the end, and this is when, when I was talking about earlier in the show, there's going to be heavy spoilers. Uh, skip if you forgot yeah. or uh, lazily just put your iPhone in your pocket or whatever. Um, gets on the plane. And for a couple of films now, I've been hoping they would do an sure. alternate take kind of thing. Yeah. And it's the year 2000. Yeah. We didn't realize it through the whole movie, but it is the year 2000, and this is the plane from the first fucking movie. Oh, which brings... How cool is so that? So much wonder. It does. It and, really does. Well, one thing that it does it is, is it explains why Tony Todd wasn't in the fourth film. Yeah. Because he was only around for the first four chronologically. Yeah, right. Um, first three chronologically? Because this comes before. Yeah, okay. I, I see what you Chronologically mean. in the time of the... Yes. In the universe, yeah. not in the release. Yeah, I keep thinking the fourth film happens at the same time as the first one, but it just leads into it. Yeah. So yeah, it ends up being a sort of prequel. What's amazing about that is not just the kind of the twist of it, or the, haha, you didn't realize it was 2000 the whole time, like we were watching The Room or something. <laughs> but uh, I still never got to the bottom of that. Still yeah. don't know what the fuck. I pointed that out to other people, and no one, no one has any idea what's happening there. Tommy, why aren't you emailing us? So it's all well and good that they, they brought in this little twist ending, but also on a larger scale, it's all about fate. It makes right. you question everything they did in this movie. And did it? start a chain reaction that caused four other horrific accidents right because they did or didn't do one thing because the crash was to get back at them and how far back does this go right and had they not you know it's not as if all disaster on planet earth is caused by right. someone who dodged it at some point so would that plane have blown up if they weren't on it right well you the know, implication would... that the film makes is that Final Destination 5, the characters that survived needed to die. Right. So there was a plane crash that killed them. The characters that should have died on that plane crash caused the deaths of the characters in Final Destination 2. Sure. So what we know for sure is that the ripple effect lasts for three of the disasters. And I'm sure we could contrive some, some connection to the roller coaster. And that's as far as I need to go. Well, that's, again, assuming that the plane crashed because they were on it. And not that the plane would have crashed anyways. Right. Because while that plane is crashing, there's somebody in Uptown being shot in the face. Sure. Well, They the, probably have nothing to do, much like the roller coaster people, with everybody else. But the one thing that is really interesting about it is that the premonition, where is that coming from? Right. Because right. you have these disasters, and if death is such a player of these characters, you know, sure. if it's such a fucking chess game, yeah. why is death allowing in each of these disasters people to survive if not to continue the disaster right right exactly wow an, an answer we never get an answer again only tony todd has I that, that was, the movie ends on tony todd like that's a thing right like he's the the fucking guy for some reason that was uh, a conversation no one was ever meant to have I, I about know. final destination we are the best donate.doublefeatureshow.com um I guess, I mean, it didn't hit me till we actually reached the 200 hour mark. That's a lot of programming. Yeah. So here was the vote with your dollar idea I mentioned uh, previously. I'd like to know what 200 hours worth of programming is worth to people. Because to you and I, it's worth free because we don't, we don't pay one another for the show. I don't listen to it. And so yeah. yeah, you don't even fucking <laughs> listen to the show. I'm subjected to it. Yeah. So we are always amazed that people even voluntarily listen. Right. That's already like a sure a hundred dollar donation. That's right that's there. A, that, yeah. You have a hundred dollar donation credit just by listening. Yeah, but so, that can be turned into real dollars, which you can send <laughs> to donate.doublefeatureshow.com. Thank you. We're taking a poll using capitalism. Uh, the website is doublefeatureshow.com. If you are too poor to donate, 
Totally understandable. Go get a free audiobook. We get paid for that. That is, I believe it's bookshow.doublefeatureshow.com. Not double sleepy nap time. You can read all about something. So next time we've got two films. Uh, We're sticking with horror, but we're going the other end of the spectrum. And it won't seem like it with the titles. Um, But we're going to cover The Tingler and A Bucket of Blood. Perfect. Um, Which sound, they just sound like more Final Destination movies. They do. And A Bucket of Blood is free. You can find it for free on the internet. Public domain. That's a Roger Corman. And The Tingler is a William Castle. It is with Vincent Price. Watch more goddamn motherfucking film. Bye.